When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. The invitation of the Lord stands. Come. Door is open. Please enter. And we actually get the privilege of entering that open door in chapter 4. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 is where we'll finish this week's lesson. And it's, these two chapters are incredible. What, by the time we dive into chapter 6 next week, we get to meet the four horsemen of the apocalypse right off the bat. And we start to see the seals and the, and the opened and the work of God throughout these different millennia of time. It starts to get intense next week, so brace yourself. But before we get there, we have two magnificent chapters that are meant to reassure us that we are truly in the hands of God and the hands of Christ. In fact, each one of those two people gets a chapter here. And chapter 4 is meant to introduce us to God. And then chapter 5 is meant to introduce us to Christ. And they do it in a way that is meant to leave us with a particular emotion. Now, that emotion is awe. And unfortunately, I don't know if we, if we understand that word well enough. Because it's been so watered down by becoming the word awesome. I joked with my students once when I was teaching this to them and said, uh, what, what word do we use for, or what words have been used in the past to describe something awesome? And they, or what's the new word? I mean, awesome was a word we used a ton in our day and when I was young, but the, you know, young people today, they talk, oh, it's lit. It's fire. I mean, you talk to your kids or your grandkids and it's amazing the slang that they come up with to, to create new words to replace words like awesome. But awesome itself was just a replacement of decades and even centuries worth of other slang to talk about something that was amazing in some way. I actually did some research and had some fun with this. Uh, how, how's this for a quick list? In the 1920s, a popular word for it was ducky. Oh, that's so ducky. Uh, or in the 1930s, the, the cat's pajamas and the bee's knees. Well, I've, heard, I've heard of those before. I didn't realize they were so old, 1930s. 1940s, it was hip. 1950s was cool. 60s was groovy, 70s was ace, or way decent, which is so fun. That's way decent, okay. Uh, or mind-blowing, which originally was supposed to describe the effects of hallucinogenic drugs. So yes, mind-blowing in literal ways. The 1980s included words like bodacious, and fly, and gnarly, and wicked. <laughs> now it's getting closer to my day. The 90s, fat but spelled with P-H. Do you remember that? That's, it's almost embarrassing to, to realize that we use words like that. The, t the 2000s, it was sweet. And that's a word I, I still hear. But then I went back even further in time, and the words like this have always existed. In the 1300s, they would use a phrase like, thriven and through. Like, that is so thriven and through, dude. It's like, really? Okay. 1400s, gradely. The 1500s, jelly. Can you picture some, some Brit in the 1500s? Oh, such, such a jelly, jelly uh, outfit you're wearing, Your Majesty. Uh, or the 1600s, eximius. That sounds a little more uh, highfalutin, but that's it's supposed to mean awesome. The 1700s, we used words like top gallant and budgery. And the 1800s used words like boss. And that's kind of fun since we still use that sometimes in our day too. Now, all of those can be synonyms throughout time for a word like awesome. And yet awesome is so overused that it's lost most of its meaning. There's an interesting website called the Urban Dictionary. And when I looked up awesome there, <laughs> some of its funnier definitions, something Americans used to describe everything. Makes me wonder if the Urban Dictionary was written overseas. Uh, or another definition, the American adjective, a concept, object, or act whose worth lies somewhere between non-objectionable and life-changing. Its use in lieu of all other adjectives. For example, we defeated Hitler. Awesome! We have chips. 
awesome. <laughs> you get the sense? It's like, wow, if it covers the entire spectrum, then it has lost its significance. It's lost its meaning. Or one other definition from the Urban Dictionary. Awesome is a word used by Americans to cover over the huge gaps in their vocabulary. It is one of the three words which make up most American sentences, the other two being a swear word and some form of taking the Lord's name in vain. Now, hopefully, as Latter-day Saints, we avoid the other two. But have we, have we sucked out the significance of the word awesome by applying it to everything? Especially when you realize that the root of awesome is awe. Something that is awe-inspiring. We've even messed with the word awful. Because awful just seems like something that's the opposite of awesome. But to be awe full, to be full of awe, something that invokes such deep feelings of wonder and admiration and respect. Stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon and feel some awe. Look into the night sky where there's no light pollution and get a sense of awe at how expansive the universe is and how tiny we are in comparison. And yet realizing that God loves us individually, that's awe-inspiring. That's awesome in the ultimate sense of the word. The reason I bring this up, and the reason I had this little exercise, <laughs> this run through historical vocabulary with my students, is because I wanted them to know the goal of chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Revelation. This cannot be merely an intellectual experience where we try to unlock some of the symbols and make sense of what is being shown here. No, it has to be an emotional one. It has to be a relational and experiential time in the scriptures where we come to see God in all of his glory and grandeur and, and stand in awe of who he is. In fact, not stand at all, just kneel to bow before him in wonder at our Heavenly Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. If you will pray for the Holy Ghost to enter our conversation in such a way that by the end of chapter, five, at chapter 4, you see God for who he really is, and by the end of chapter 5, you, are, you stand all amazed by the love Jesus offers you, then we will have done our work correctly in these two chapters. And if by the end of 4 and 5, you don't feel those things toward God, then we need to go back and try harder to experience this in some way. In, we need to have the, the Moses experience. The thought that man is nothing is something I never had supposed. But now I'm supposing it. I'm getting it. Or the Enoch experience, thinking, thinking that he got it and then really coming to know God and being blown away to the point that his heart swelled wide as eternity. Well, for an experience like that, turn to chapter 4 of Revelation and begin in verse 1 where the revelation really begins. Up to this point, chapter 1 revealed Christ. And there he is with the stars in his right hand, standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. But then we took a pause in chapter 2 and 3 to aim these epistles at the seven churches there in Western Asia Minor. Now we're back to the revelation of things and to put in perspective all that we'll see about the chaos of life in the last days. We need to know that God and Jesus Christ are there, present, in charge, hand on the helm, and everything will be okay as long as we turn to them. So chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Remember, Jesus sets before us an open door that no man can shut. Well, here this door opens in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. We saw the trumpet back in chapter 1. Here it returns in chapter 4. A very clear clarion call. 
It's often to give us warning. Remember that phrase back in 1 Corinthians 14? If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Well, this one's going to be crystal clear, okay? Here's the trumpet. It's talking, and it said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So this is going to be prophecy, things that are yet to come. But if you'll come to me, I'll show them to you. And that's why I've opened the door of heaven. Now, this is where we can go back to the idea of the, can the seven golden candlesticks, not as, seven, as sev seven separate ones, but as the seven branches of the menorah. Because if we picture that as the candlestick, then where are we? We're in the holy place in the temple. Think about all those promises that we just saw uh, to those who overcome in chapter 2 and 3. All these temple blessings, here I am, a nail in the shore place, here I am, a pillar in the temple with a new name and with a rod of iron and with white raiment and sitting upon the throne of God. Ooh, if I'm going to enter the throne room, though, that's the holy of holies, not the holy place. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant had a lid called the mercy seat, also known as the throne of atonement. The covenant is the throne of Christ, and for us to come unto the covenant, we are entering the throne room. Now, to do that, though, we would have to pass the veil. We'd have to have that door, quote-unquote, opened so that we could enter the presence of God. Well, that seems like what is happening in chapter 4, verse 1, that we've already been out there in the holy place by the candlestick, and now the door is opened in heaven for us to enter the presence of God. Imagine what we'll see there. Well, look at verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So here we are in the Holy of Holies. The, the Lord, or, or the Father in this case, is sitting upon the throne of grace. He sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now, remember what he said back in Revelation 3. If you'll overcome, I'll let you sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. It's an odd-looking throne. There seems to be room enough for everyone. But that's what at one mint does. It brings us all together into one. But if we'll sit there, come to the throne, and notice how he describes it. He that sat on it looked like jasper and sardine stone. Now, what's all that about? For this, it, it's worth the effort to search elsewhere in Scripture for these kinds of precious stones. And one of the places that you'll see them is in Ezekiel chapter 28. And it's describing the Garden of Eden with those stones. It's also repeated later on in the book of Revelation as part of the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. And what I love about that is if you picture jasper and sardine stones present in Eden as well as in New Jerusalem, this is the first as well as the last. This is the original paradise and then the coming paradise that we are called upon to build. You get a sense that it's all coming full circle, and God who inspired the first is, is the same God who in inspires the second. We're just called upon to help him build it. Another place that you'll see these two stones is in Exodus chapter 28. And in Exodus 28, it describes the high priest's breastplate of judgment. We studied this one last year. And remember, there were 12 stones across it. Each one was a precious stone. And on it was inscribed a name of one of the tribes of Israel. It was a sense that the, the high priest would remember that the house of Israel that he bore responsibility for were meant to be over his heart. And they were precious stones in the sight of God. Well, the same is true here. But what's interesting about the, the names inscribed upon them it's really fascinating because sardius, or in this case sardine, it's the same kind of, it's the same stone, was the stone used to, to signify the, the tribe of Reuben, the first son of, of Jacob. And then the jasper stone 
was meant to represent Benjamin, who was the last son of Jacob. So picture the entire family, start to finish, summed up by these bookends on the breastplate of judgment. And the sardine stone and the jasper stone meant in some ways to personify the entire family that, is, that the high priest has responsibility for. Well, here's God the Father, and his look is the look of a sardine stone and a jasper stone. And it, it, almost engraven in him is the precious stones of all of his children, his entire posterity. It's actually interesting, too, because there's connections to Christ here as well. Because what does Reuben mean in Hebrew? Behold a son. And what does Benjamin mean in Hebrew? The son of my right hand. And so picture the father bearing the image of the son, or vice versa. And this son of his right hand, there on the throne alongside him. Even the colors are fascinating. Because jasper, sometimes it's red, sometimes it's brown. It can be yellow, it can be green. There's a lot of possibilities. But jasper is typically clear white. So think about the purity of the the snow and the wool and now the jasper stone. And then the sardine stone is typically blood red. Uh, it's also known as the carnelian in, in geology today. But to think of purity alongside Christ's selfless sacrifice, the blood of the lamb that makes our garments spotless white. Remember he said that back in chapter one, I have washed you in my blood. So to me, there's something powerful about picturing God upon his throne, symbolizing atonement, symbolizing the family, uh, all brought home to him because of his beloved son at his right hand. That's all, and again, that's all right there on the breastplate of judgment for the high priest of Israel. Back to Revelation, it also mentioned that there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And to think about rainbows, rainbows, if it's round about the throne, picture it as a crown of light. Rainbow is one of the most beautiful forms of light because it takes that be beautiful purity of white and then spreads it out across the spectrum. And you start to see all these other colors. When we studied the tabernacle last year, we saw that taken as a whole, every color of the rainbow would be there visible somewhere. You get a sense of the same thing on the breastplate of judgment for the high priest. Now, you name the color and you'll, you'll find it somewhere. We also see the rainbow in the symbolism of the flood, as well as the symbolism of Zion. That not only was it an act of mercy on God's part to promise, I will never again destroy the earth with, with flood, this rainbow will be a reminder that even in the darkest storm, the light will eventually shine again and remind you of the love and mercy of God. But also in Enoch's case, just as Zion was caught up to heaven, so will it someday return from heaven. There's the full rainbow right there. It is a stairway to heaven, but it is a stairway of light. And it connects heaven and earth just like Zion is meant to. There's the throne of God. And if it also has the image of an emerald, emeralds are green. And green is a magnificent symbol for life. Picture a lush forest or jungle. Picture the tree of life with its leaves bringing life to the nations. We'll see that at the end of the book of Revelation. Here we're seeing it at the beginning. That, by the way, Emerald was also one of the stones used on the breastplate of judge, uh, the breastplate of judgment for the high priest. And you want to guess which tribe of Israel had its name inscribed upon the emerald stone? Well, we already saw Reuben, behold a son. We already saw Benjamin, son of my right hand. The emeralds represented the tribe of Judah, and that's Jesus. The scepter shall not pass from his hand. It will be, oh, a scepter of light in some ways. And Jesus and Judah meant to represent it. Well, that's verse 3. How about verse 4? 
and round about the throne, or JST, in the midst of the throne. And that seems really, really odd unless we understand that this throne is unlike any other. It's seats enough for everyone. He wants us to sit with him. And so in the midst of the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Again, go back to Revelation 3 and sit with me on my throne. We're seeing it happening. 24 elders. Now, in section 77 of the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph was confused by this and wondered, what is that all about? Who are these people? And so he asks and gets an answer. We are to understand that these elders whom John saw were elders who had been faithful in the work of the ministry and were dead, who belonged to the seven churches and were then in the paradise of God. And so that's beautiful. In some ways, it makes it so personal for John. If he set up most of these churches, except for Ephesus, if he knows the people there, if he has oh, set Polycarp apart to help run the church in, in Smyrna, for example, if there's a personal connection and now he's seen these elders, they made it. They overcame. They were able to navigate life in this wicked world and endure persecution and opposition, and they overcame. There they are sitting with him in his throne, as promised, wearing white raiment, as promised, crowns on their heads, as promised. God keeps his word. And it's all happening right there before us at the throne of God himself. Now, there's some other possibilities as far as symbolism is concerned that's really beautiful. Because there's a verse in First Chronicles, buried there in an obscure part of the Old Testament, that says that there were 24 divisions of the Aaronic priesthood that ministered at the temple. Like in the book of Luke, when it's Zechariah's turn to go minister at the temple, it was, he was one of those 24 courses of priests. And they would just rotate around. Everybody get about two weeks. And then you're off duty for the next year as it makes its rounds through the tribe of Levi. Well, to think about these elders, picture priesthood power here. And picture 24 seats to describe all the divisions of the priesthood, all in their proper order, their proper turn, but none greater than the other, all gathered together at one with God on his throne. And it's temple service that they've come to render. So yeah, we're here in the Holy of Holies with them. Another way to think about this as just a possibility is the number 24 means 12 twice. And so to take the 12 tribes of Israel, for example, and couple them with the 12 apostles, for example. And I'm just using examples here. That's the beauty of symbolism. It can have all kinds of possibilities. As long as they don't teach you things that you know are false from elsewhere in Scripture, then allow it as a possibility. In trying to make sense of symbols, often you'll know that you're wrong more than you'll have it completely confirmed that you're right. If somewhere else in Scripture says, nope, that's not the way it works, then forget about it. But if it, if it suggests possibilities that you do see elsewhere in Scripture and helps you deepen your appreciation and understanding of those possibilities, then run with it. And I love the thought of God bringing everyone home to him, whether Old Testament tribes of Israel or New Testament apostles of the Lord. There's supposed to be an overlap or a, a repetition of that symbol in the 12 apostles representing the 12 tribes of Israel. They're all stones, precious stones on the breastplate of the high priest, right? They are all treasured and loved by the Lord. And to the point, I want you to sit here on the throne right alongside me. So saints of any age or dispensation, there's room for you. Please come. He then says in verse 5 that out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, or the JST, the seven servants of God, that we met in each of the seven churches back in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Now, Think about this throne. What, it, what is it made of? It's the Ark of the Covenant. 
What's inside the ark? Well, the covenant is, the tablets of stone. Where did Moses get those? Ah, Mount Sinai. And if you were to, to describe the mountain of the Lord, with all of its temple symbolism, but the mountain of the Lord as far as, far as Sinai is concerned, how would you describe it when the covenant was being inscribed? Sound like lightnings and thunderings and voices in some ways what we're seeing in chapter 5 is an image of Mount Sinai all over again here we are in the temple the throne room heaven Mount Sinai pick your symbol whatever you choose they're all basically the same and it's a place of brilliant light and booming sound How's that for the sound of rushing waters? These voices that, that John is hearing in the presence of God. We'll see in a moment more of what those voices are saying. But there with the seven lamps of fire, a nod to the menorah that we just left, when we passed through the veil from the holy place to the holiest place, we're getting closer and closer to God here. To the point that in verse 6, we see that before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now it says that they were in the midst of the throne and round about. There's a JST that clarifies who's where. It says in the midst of the throne were the four and twenty elders. And round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Okay, so they're each in their spot. But to picture these beasts around the throne of God and before the throne of God, this sea of glass like unto crystal. That was another one that caught Joseph Smith's attention. And he's like, okay, what do you mean by that? So, section 77 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 1, he asked, and the Lord's answer, it is the earth in its sanctified, immortal, and eternal state. And to think about the earth when it receives its paradisiacal glory, when the earth becomes the celestial kingdom of God, to have it described there as a sea of glass like crystal. Now, I've had some people complain like, well, no mountains? Are you kidding? Again, don't take everything so literally. If it's literal, it's going to be great water skiing. At least that's something. But this think about glass being so pure that you can see through it. In the Doctrine and Covenants also, this is section 130, it describes the earth in its sanctified state as a Urim and Thummim. So picture again, something clear whereby you can see all things, lights and perfections all coming through. This is the verse from section 130, verse 9. This earth in its sanctified and immortal state will be made like unto crystal and will be a Urim and Thummim to the inhabitants who dwell thereon whereby all things pertaining to an inferior kingdom, or all kingdoms of a lower order, will be manifest to those who dwell on it, and this earth will be Christ's. In some ways it goes back to what we saw in the letter, or the promises to those who overcome, that they'll be given a white stone, they'll be given a Urim and Thummim of their own, so they can see and know as they are seen and as they are known. Well, imagine before the throne of God, the whole earth like that. Imagine to see things so clearly, clear as crystal. The interesting thing about crystal, by the way, is it's not susceptible to change or to decay. And so this is the eternal kingdom of God. This is celestial glory right before his throne. And it's a place of knowledge, of vision, of sight, of clarity. And can you imagine coming into God's presence and him seeing right through you, but you not being ashamed of what he sees? You've been washed in the blood of the lamb. You're wearing white raiment. He's given you a crown on your head because you've overcome. And to see these incredible promises then, I think we have a lot to learn about each other, about ourselves, and most importantly, about God, before this earth becomes that kind of Urim and Thummim. But then what about these beasts? What, and especially that they're full of eyes before and behind. 
We're going to see more of that in just a moment. But Joseph asked about the beasts also in section 77, verse 2. And he was told that those are figurative expressions. Now, in his sermon in Nauvoo in 1843 that I referred to at the beginning of this week's lesson, he did talk about literal beasts in heaven as far as the animal kingdom that God has created and that God will exalt as well. And so that goes on. But to, to think of these figuratively as well, in terms of, so what do they represent? Because notice what these beasts are. Verse 7, the first beast was like a lion. And when we use words like like, we need to take this more figuratively, like section 77 tells us. Uh, but picture something that's along those lines, something like a lion. Second, the second beast was like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And back to DNC 77, verse 3, we're taught that those things represent the glory of the classes of beings in their destined order or sphere of creation in the enjoyment of their eternal felicity. Now, if they represent the glory of a class of being, if their figurative expressions meant to help us picture something, if this is a symbol, I'm supposed to kind of peel away another layer of meaning. Well, take these four and what do you think about them? A lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle. And it's interesting to think that the lion we often know or refer to as the king of beasts. Well, if it's a calf that grows up to be an ox, wouldn't that be the king of domesticated animals? Think about the work, the, the beast of burden, the work that an ox can do. Think about man as the king of creation, given dominion over the animal kingdom back in the creation account. And the eagle, that could be considered the king of birds. So whether it's wild animals or domesticated animals or birds or just all creation, you are seeing a class of being in their order of or in their sphere of creation, enjoying eternal felicity. Felicity is happiness. And so picture a smile on all of these animal faces, these beasts. But there they are surrounding the throne of God, almost as representatives of everything beneath them in their quote unquote kingdoms. Uh, the, the jungle will send the lion and the farm will send the ox. You understand what I'm saying here? And so picture all of them surrounding the throne of God. Now, there's some other possibilities because in much of Christian history and Christian art, you'll see it in sculptures, you'll see it in stained glass windows, you'll see it in paintings and engravings. They take the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they compare them to these four beasts of the book of Revelation. And Matthew is the man where you see Christ as the son of David. Uh, Mark is the lion, is represented as the lion because Jesus is there to roar through the book of Mark. In Luke, you see Jesus, you see the book of Luke often described or personified or depicted, I should say, as an ox because Jesus is a gentle beast of burden in the book of Luke. It's a beautiful Christology. And then John, as we've said already, was the eagle with the soaring Christology of Jesus as Son of God. It, it's, it is interesting to see that there are ways to, to depict Jesus Christ through all of these, these beasts, these animals, as portrayed in the Gospels. But there's another element here as well that is fascinating. And so as another possibility for symbolic meaning here, if this is a temple scene, if this is the Holy of Holies, we're in the throne room of God. If it's already been likened to Mount Sinai, and you picture there in the wilderness, tabernacle at the center of Israel, and then tribes surrounding the tabernacle. And these 12 tribes, almost like the 12 spots on a, on a clock, surrounding it, all looking inward to keep God at the center of all that they did. Now, with 12, you can divide it into four, where there's a north, south, east, and west, and there is a tribe put at each of the four cardinal directions. And what's interesting about them is, according to many uh, Jewish depictions, where there is some kind of banner with an insignia representing each of the 12 tribes of Israel. We already saw the 12 stones on the breastplate, and each one represents a different tribe. Well, to have an insignia or banner that shows them all, what's interesting is if you were to go directly east of the tabernacle, 
the tribe in charge of those three would be Judah. And Judah is depicted as a lion. If you were to go west, the main tribe to the west is the tribe of Ephraim, and it is depicted as an ox. If you were to go south, the tribe of Reuben is in center spot, and that is described as a man. Behold a son, remember. And to the north, you have the tribe of Dan that is depicted as an eagle. So just as a possibility here, one other way to envision this is this is a temple scene. This is a house of Israel scene. And God in his throne, in his temple there on Sinai, surrounded by the house of Israel and with this lion and ox and eagle and man, there's the house of Israel all surrounding him. Think about the leaders of that house from the tribe of Levi as the 24 elders. You have priesthood, you have people. This is the kingdom of God surrounding his throne. Next, you see in verse 8 that the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. We saw that earlier, right? When we first met them in verse 6, these four beasts were full of eyes before and behind. Picture someone having eyes behind, in the back of their head is how we say it. As if they are aware of everything. You can't sneak up on them. They see everything. This is as close as we can get to an all-seeing eye. Well, these are all-seeing eyes, okay? So, full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night. Now, what do they do day and night since they can't ever rest from doing it? They are saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. There's the past and the present and the future, just like we saw it repeated several times in chapter 1. So what are, the, what are these beasts doing? They're praising God without ceasing. There's that great word in Helaman 10 when Nephi is given the sealing power because he served God with such unwearyingness. Such a great word. Unwearyingness. That would be a good word to describe these beasts as well, especially if they represent the house of Israel. Here we are surrounding the temple of God, coming into his presence. And what are we doing all day, all night, without ever wanting to rest? We're praising our Father in heaven. He deserves it. He is holy, holy, holy. And he was and is and will forever be that holy. Now, with that in mind, it makes the eyes and the wings all the more significant. Because these are strange. Look, I, mean, I was following you pretty well when you just talked about lions and eagles and oxen and men. But full of eyes and then six wings. There's some fascinating artwork you can find online if you describe, if you, if you search for these kinds of images, and all kinds of artistic renderings that all seem a little strange. So again, John is writing symbolically. But what is what do these wings and eyes then symbolize? Notice in section 77, this is our go-to revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants to help us see some things in Revelation more clearly. In section 77, verse 4, Joseph asks about the eyes and the wings. I would too. And here's his answer. Their eyes are a representation of light and knowledge. That is, they are full of knowledge. And their wings are a representation of power to move, to act, etc., now, that's, that's pretty good. If you were to play, let's, put, let's pretend we're playing Pictionary, shall we? And if I were to tell you to draw knowledge, how would you do that? Now, we might draw a brain because we know that's where the knowledge is stored, right? Uh, and yet, the eye would be a pretty good depiction too. Think about how much you know because you see things. You watch, you learn by example. It, it's amazing how much we learn through our sight. And so if we were going to try to symbolize light and knowledge, I mean, it's the eye that perceives light and therefore gains the knowledge related to it. And if we put those eyes everywhere, before or behind, all over, oh, is there a better way to depict 
omniscience. Picture these beasts knowing everything, having all knowledge, being open to all light. And since God himself is the light of the world, since he sits on this throne surrounded by a rainbow, which is this crown of light, if it's emerald green with light and life all coming together in these glorious symbols, then even these beasts partake of that divine omniscience. Now, if they're all-knowing, then that's the eyes. What about the wings? Did you catch what was said in section 77? It represents power to move, to act. Think about what we do with our feet. And I can move and I can act. I can go. I can go forward and back and side to side. But imagine if I had wings. I could go anywhere. I could go up and down, not just forward and back and side to side. And to have six wings, that is up, down, back, forth, front, back. I can move, I mean, three-dimensionally in both. That's take six right there, and I can go anywhere I want. And if it represents the power to move and, the act, and to act, isn't that just another word for agency? Again, if we were playing Pictionary and I said, draw agency, oh, how would you do that? Well, six wings isn't, isn't a bad option. So now let's take all this symbolism together and try to understand what John is hoping to portray here. And what do you have? You have these creatures, these beasts, that are the highest of their class or kingdom. The king of beasts and so forth. Everything else that is like them is beneath them. And yet here they are. Here they are in all of their omniscience and all of their infinite agency. I'm the highest there is, and I know everything, and I can do anything, and what am I doing? I'm worshiping God the Father. I recognize how little I am. Forget king of beasts. He's the king of kings, and he alone is worthy of worship. Holy, holy, holy is he who was and is and is to come. I know everything, and the best use of my knowledge is to honor God. I can do anything, and the best use of my agency is to fall at his feet in humble adoration. Are you sensing any awe? well up in you? Are you ready to kneel, to bow, to worship? Not to just give some kind of token acquiescence or acknowledgement that, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm a theist. I believe in God. No. Have you experienced him? Have you accepted his invitation to come in? When the door in heaven opens, and you see the lightning, and you hear the thunder, and you hear the voices, and the sound of the trump, and you're ready to join those 24 elders that are sitting with God on his throne. You're ready to climb the covenant, to sit upon the mercy seat that lies above it, that covers the covenant, including times we've broken it. There's something profound about this scene. And I hope it's a preview of scenes yet to come in our own lives. It certainly is an echo of what existed in pre-mortality. In fact, the way the chapter ends in verse 9 through 11, I want to be here for this too. When those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou, not us, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, 
and for thy pleasure they are and were created. For thy pleasure. Can you picture God in his work and glory? Glory, finding pleasure in bringing to pass our immortality and eternal life. In making sure there's room on the throne for everyone. Get up here. All, all 24 elders and every, every station within the priesthood they're meant to represent. You beasts surrounding the throne of God. Just come. Come home. Come up. Come unto me. I want you here. No wonder we offer him such honor and such thanks. No wonder all we want to give him is glory. Because it's glory he's trying to give to us. Instead of it being tug of war where I want it and he, no, he wants it, it becomes hot potato. And he's trying to give it to us, but we're trying to give it to him. Notice what happened with the crowns. Remember to him that overcometh, I will give them a crown. And these 24 elders were given crowns of gold. And yet, what are they doing? It's like, that's like they asked themselves that question. What am I doing wearing this thing? I have no right to the throne. Only God does. And so to take off that throne, to undecoronate, is that even a word? <laughs> to remove it, and then to cast the crown before the throne of God. There's a wonderful Christian band that is called Casting Crowns, and that's where they get their, their title, their name. All they, they, they are not in it for their own glory. All they want to do is glorify God. And that's the message and meaning of Revelation chapter 4. If we read it right, if we allow the Holy Ghost to open the eyes of our understanding, then our hearts will be moved to do likewise. To kneel before his throne. And any crown he offers us, we return to him. Thou art holy. And thine be the glory forever. Now, if we feel that towards the Father in chapter 4, I pray chapter 5 will help us feel the same thing about the Son. They're together on the throne after all, right? They're, they're making room for all of us through the atonement of Jesus Christ. But what if he hadn't been able to do that? What was riding on his willingness and ability to atone for all of us if it was only through his blood that our clothes could be washed white? Well, turn with me to chapter 5 and pray for another celestial experience. In verse 1, And I saw in the right hand, and there's that covenant hand again, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now, if it's written on the inside and on the outside, there must be a lot to write there. you got to print double-sided I'm trying to squeeze in as, much wor as many words as I possibly can into this document. And it's sealed with seven seals. Now, in the ancient world, when a king would write a document and then roll it up or fold it up and then put some wax on it and then with their seal, their insignia, they would stamp it. It was only intended for someone that had the right to open the seal of the king. It was addressed to someone of incredible authority or importance. And this one, oh, it's sealed with seven seals. Who on earth could that possibly be addressed to? Well, we're about to see. Now, Joseph Smith had questions about this verse as well. And so in section 77, verses 6 and 7, he's asking, what's up with the seal? Or I should say the book with the seven seals. You could picture a scroll, a book, whatever you want, but what does, it, what does it represent? And the answer, we are to understand that it contains the revealed will, mysteries, and the works of God, the hidden things of his economy concerning this earth during the 7,000 years of its continuance or its temporal existence. In essence, we get a seal for each thousand years. And though geologic time is different than scriptural time, to see from Adam 
that if you'd follow the genealogies in the book of Genesis and elsewhere in the Old Testament, that was about 4,000 BC. So you have 4,000 years until the coming of Christ, and there he comes at the, the dispensation of the meridian of times, a midpoint, a high point. And then you get 2,000 more years until we get to our time period. And in this age of the restoration, when the Father's work really gets underway to prepare the world to usher in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So we have the 4,000 years before Christ, 2,000 after, we're now at six, and then a seventh thousand years, which entails the millennium. Again, it seems fitting that the seventh day would be a day of rest, millennial reign. And it seems fitting that after Jesus was here and then died, there would be two more days pass and that he would return on the third day. Again, a thousand years as a day. We saw that in the book of Peter. Uh, there's some beautiful symbolism here too. In fact, Elder Orson F. Whitney of the Quorum of the Twelve years ago said it this way, The book which John saw represented the real history of the world, what the eye of God has seen, what the recording angel has written, and the 7,000 years corresponding to the seven seals of the apocalyptic volume are as seven great days during which Mother Earth will fulfill her mortal mission, laboring six days and resting upon the seventh, her period of sanctification. And we saw that in the book of Moses in chapter 7, where Enoch is having his visions of the earth itself finally being cleansed during the millennial reign. Okay, now, so what in, in some ways what's happening here is picture, well, picture this. When I got my mission call, I was a student at BYU, a freshman living in the dorms, and this was before they sent them out via email. They'd send them in a big envelope, and they'd all were coming to Helaman Halls, where so many freshmen lived, and so many freshmen were waiting for mission calls. And the wonderful workers there at the post office at the dorms would tape some helium balloons to them and set them out and call you and say, your mission call's here, and you'd sprint down there and grab this thing. It had your name on it, and mine said Elder Jared M. Halverson. And I thought, whoa, I've never been called Elder Halverson before. Uh, and it was kind of surreal to realize that two years of my life were waiting for me in this envelope. It was addressed to me. I was the one that was supposed to open it and accept the mission call inside. Now, later in the book of Revelation, we'll see something similar given to John himself. And it's a, a scroll, a book, and he's supposed to open it. In fact, he's supposed to eat it. We'll get there uh, next week. But it's his mission call. And what's interesting here is picture this book with the seven seals as the Savior's mission call. And only he who could open all seven and perform the Father's work and glory through all the 7,000 years of the earth's temporal existence. Who's going to be able to do that? Who has the right authority to open this book? That is the question. In some ways, what Revelation 5 is, it's the long version of the council in heaven. In the book of Abraham, it simply has the father asking, whom shall I send? And the Savior raises his hand and says, here am I, send me. And then Satan, Lucifer, says, here am I, send me. And the father says, I will send the first. And that's it. And it seems pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And, and God, the father, chose Jesus as the son. Great. Well, it was so much more dramatic than that. And Revelation 5 helps introduce some of that drama to the scene. It wasn't as simple as any, any takers, any volunteers, and Jesus saying, sure, I'm willing to do it. Let's slow it down and see how it's described here. Revelation 5, verse 2 and 3. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? In other words, he's asking, who can perform the mission of Messiah? Now, notice the difference. What's the adjective describing the angel? He's strong. But what's the adjective that strong angel is looking for? Worthy. It's not strength that is going to force open the seals. It's not strength that's going to push someone through Gethsemane. No, it's worthiness. It is perfect purity. Because any sin 
would disqualify him from becoming a sinless sacrifice. So that is the question. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals? Who's worthy to perform the Savior's saving work? And here's where the drama really begins. It wasn't an immediate hand going up, here am I, send me. No. Verse 3, And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, sounds like they looked everywhere, but no man was able to open the book, neither to look thereon, They couldn't even bring themselves to look at it because the mission call was impossible. Do you remember earlier this year when we studied Luke chapter 3 and there was a JST there that takes us to the appendix because the, the, the edition was too long to fit in the footnotes. It, to me, is one of the most powerful Joseph Smith translation editions anywhere in Scripture. And it's Luke chapter 3, verses 4 through 11. I call it the Ten Commandments for Christ. And what it is, is a description of the Savior's mission call. The way he walks you through the ten different things. There just happen to be ten things that the Messiah would have to be able to do in order to save humanity. And compared to his Ten Commandments, ours are a piece of cake. Don't kill someone. Don't steal their stuff. Well, how's this? How's that compared to what the Savior is being asked to do? Here's, here's the description. For behold and lo, he shall come. As it is written in the book of the prophets, and then here's the ten things he's going to have to be able to do. Number one, to take away the sins of the world. And remember, to do that, you can't have committed any yourself. That's why... He has to be worthy, not merely strong. Number two, and to bring salvation unto the heathen nations. Everybody has to have a chance. Even those on the outside have to be brought in. Number three, to gather together those who are lost, who are of the sheepfold of Israel, yea, even the dispersed and afflicted. Who's going to be able to gather all of Israel, find every last lost sheep? Or four, And also to prepare the way and make possible the preaching of the gospel unto the Gentiles. How to go from exclusivity to radical inclusivity. Who's going to be able to pull that off? Number five. And to be a light unto all who sit in darkness unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Who will be able to shine that brilliantly to illuminate every place of darkness? Number six to bring to pass the resurrection from the dead, which means you'll have to die and then conquer death in the process. Or number seven, to ascend up on high, to dwell on the right hand of the Father until the fullness of time and the law and the testimony shall be sealed and the keys of the kingdom shall be delivered up again unto the Father. Yeah, who's going to be able to pull that off? To overcome all things, to ascend to God, having the keys ready to deliver, the keys of the, the, keys of the kingdom, The key of David, to open and no man shut, to shut and no man open. How about the eighth commandment for Christ? To administer justice unto all. How on earth could anyone do that without selling anyone short? And justice to one meaning injustice to another. No, complete justice for everyone. That alone would require omniscience. How about number nine? To come down in judgment upon all all. You're going to have to be the judge of quick and dead. You're going to have to know what's right to do for everyone, regardless of circumstance. And then finally, number 10, to convince all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed, and all this in the day that he shall come. Who on earth or above the earth, or under the earth for that matter. Who in heaven, who in all of creation will be able to do that? And no wonder we wept when no one seemed qualified. That's what he says in verse 4. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Again, we can't even take a glimpse, take a peek at it. It's too intimidating. I sometimes joked with my younger students, imagine reading the newspaper in pre-mortality. 
you open the sports section and read about the Saints and the Angels. Those are the only two teams that play up there. Uh, then you open the want ads because you're curious what your role on earth will be. And you'll see positions needed. And so it'll say help wanted. And it'll describe someone like, oh, help wanted, teacher needed. And I volunteered for that. I'd love, that sounds like a family business to me. Let, let me dive in. Uh, imagine one in bigger font saying help needed a precious vessel, a handmaid of the Lord, who will become the mother of the Son of God according to the flesh. Wow. Who on earth could do that? And thankfully, Mary was worthy of that honor. Think of everyone who's ever lived and performed work for God on earth. And they responded to some want ad in pre-mortality, if we're following the analogy. Well, if that's the case, imagine a full page spread that didn't just say help wanted, it said, it said help required. In fact, in the fine print that wasn't so fine, it said a big and a blazoned across the headlines. If this position is filled, then no other position matters. Because the help that was required was the help of a savior. Someone would have to be worthy to open the book with the seven seals and perform all of God's saving work throughout the earth's history. And no one was able to do it. Not until one holy hand was raised with Jehovah saying to Elohim, here am I, send me. I will do all that thou hast commanded, and thine be the glory. He's casting his crown too. I will keep all ten commandments of the Christ, and therefore I will become the Christ for everyone's sake. Do you get a sense of desperation on our part when no hand was held up? When no volunteers were forthcoming and we wondered, I can't even look at that book, let alone unseal it. There's no way I can accept that mission call. Is there anyone on earth or heaven that could? And Jesus can. No wonder the strong angel finally stops our tears with this language in verse 5. In fact, it's not even the angel. It says that one of the elders... One of those 24 there kneeling before the, the throne. One of the elders saith unto me, weep not. <laughs> you can picture us responding, well, wh why? What's the solution? If no one can open the book, no one can perform that mission. Well, the elder would say, someone can. His response, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. Oh, there, there he is in all his emerald green glory. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. He prevailed. He conquered this mission call. He's able to perform all the saving work. Wow, oh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Do you remember... Back in Genesis 49, when each of the tribes of Israel was given a patriarchal blessing of sorts. And when Jacob laid his hands on his son Judah, he said that Judah is a lion's whelp. And ever after, the lion was associated with that tribe. It's the leadership tribe, the kingly tribe. Picture David and Solomon and the Davidic dynasty of whom Jesus Christ would be heir. To think about the root of David. Remember that from Isaiah chapter 11? That even though it's a stump that apostate Israel has left behind, there will be a root or a shoot that grows out of the roots. It will bring forth new life. And that's what Jesus would do for the house of Israel. To me, there's something profound about this title and the reassurance it would give us. Who on earth or heaven would be able to perform this work, and to know that there's a lion out there who can roar down sin and death and save us all in the process. 
No wonder C.S. Lewis was so inspired to create of his Christ character in the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan, the lion. Such a fitting depiction of Jesus Christ. And yet, verse 6 comes as a surprise, as a surprise then. Because can you picture all of us wiping our eyes and trying to see through our, our tears? And, and where is this lion of the tribe of Judah that everyone's, everyone was hanging their hopes on? Remember, if he doesn't perform his mission, then none of our missions matter. Who is this? And in verse 6, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, not a lion, a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Or as the JST clarifies, it increases the number, having 12 horns and 12 eyes, which are the 12 servants of God sent forth upon all the earth. So there you have the 12 apostles or the 12 tribes of Israel, all the house of Israel that God is trying to bring home. Here's this interesting looking lamb. A lamb with horns and eyes all over. Again, if eyes help represent knowledge, he knows everything. In fact, he knows everyone, every last tribe of Israel, every last member of it. No wonder as a lamb, he came to, place, to take our place personally. The condescension was a personal thing for him, a relational thing. The horns seems to be more of a ram than a lamb, but a ram caught in the thicket so that every Isaac could go free. And for these horns, Think about horns as a symbol of power, authority. The oxen using his horns to herd the rest of the family home. That we saw in the patriarchal blessing of the tribe of Ephraim. But to see a lamb when you expect the lion, that to me is profound. It's one of my favorite contraries of Christ. We know him as God and man. There's a condescending contrary, but to see him as lion and lamb. When we speak of the millennium as the lion and lamb lying down together, well, of course they can. <laughs> They're all one in Christ. And to have someone who can roar down sin and death, like I said, but at the same time be so gentle and meek as to be approachable to sinners like you and me. There are times I need the lion and times I need the lamb, and I'm grateful that Jesus is both of them. It actually reminds me of what we studied a couple of weeks ago in Peter, when he described Jesus as the lamb without blemish prepared from before the foundation of the world. There's that sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb. And when we saw the lamb here, we, he stood as if he had been slain already. There's atonement preceding creation, let alone fall. That was the plan from the very beginning. And the son volunteered. And the father accepted. This is, this is the, not the war in heaven yet. We'll get there in chapter 12. But this is the premortal council. And again, do you sense how dramatic it is compared to the Cliff Notes version we get in the book of Abraham? This is as profound as it gets. And how do we respond? If we responded with tears when we realized that no one's going to be able to do this, and then we finally saw that someone actually was, he, he conquered this, he prevailed to accept this mission call. We knew he'd be able to perform it. Now what's our other reaction? If we were so far in the extreme of devastated sorrow, then how are we supposed to respond once we realize what Jesus is able to do? Look at verse 7 and 8. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. How's that for a passing of the baton? How's that for the covenant right hand of the Father passing this mission call to the covenant right hand of the Son? Will you do this? And of course he will. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. 
Now notice the language here. He came and took the book. It wasn't forced upon him. Christ willingly offered himself as that lamb. He took upon him sin, took upon him death. He asked for it all. Give me the book, Father. I accept it. I will perform thy work and thine be the glory. And yet we wanted to give so much glory to the Son as well. That's why beasts and elders, those who have been casting crowns before the Father, are now lying prostrate before the Son. With harps, how's that for songs of joy and praise? We'll get to hear some of that music in just a moment. And then golden vials full of, or, of odors. Other translations speak of bowls full of incense. And to think about, again, if we're back in the temple, the tabernacle, the last thing we pass before entering the presence of God, right before the veil is parted. And remember at the crucifixion of Christ, it was torn apart so that we could come boldly before the throne of grace. But right before the altar was, excuse me, right before the, the veil was an altar of incense, representing the prayers of the saints ascending to heaven and filling the tabernacle with a sweet savor. That's what we see here. Yes, this is a temple scene. And because the Son is willing to, to sit on the throne alongside the Father, we cast our crowns to them both. We sing songs of praise and joy. We offer our incense. What do your prayers smell like? And are they giving a sweet savor? to the Father and the Son, who are worthy of all our adoration. In verse 9 and 10, we hear the song. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy. Remember, that was the qualifying adjective we saw from the beginning of this chapter. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. There's the atonement. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, there's God as no respecter of persons and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. There's joining Jesus for the millennial reign. Now, those two verses, 9 and 10, are the first stanza and it is sung close to the throne, right around it. The four beasts, 24 elders, they are the ones singing this first verse of the song. It reminds me of the, verse of this, the verses of the song that Eliza R. Snow wrote in How Great the Wisdom and the Love. Listen to verse 1 and verse 6. How great the wisdom and the love that filled the courts on high and sent the Savior from above to suffer, bleed, and die. How great how glorious, how complete, redemption's grand design, where justice, love, and mercy meet in harmony divine. I can only imagine what the harmony would be when lions and calves and eagles and men are singing praises to Jesus Christ. I can only imagine the 24 elders harmonizing beautifully. But to picture them right around the throne of God, singing, Thou art worthy. You've redeemed us, and all praise is thine. Now that was only the first verse. and the first round, it ends up being concentric circles spreading outward until it encompasses all of creation. And so the second round, the second stanza, look at verse 11 and 12. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy of what? Worthy to receive power and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Can you picture an innumerable company of angels 
Remember, 10,000 was just the biggest word that the Greeks came up with for, as far as numbers are concerned. We'd have to be more creative. We talk about millions and then billions and then trillions. And at some point we start making up words like gazillions. But to think of an innumerable host praising the Lamb of God for his worthiness. And then finally, a third stanza. This next concentric ring, it doesn't need to go anything beyond, any further beyond this because this now encompasses all creation. In verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Can you picture all of creation joining in to these praises for the Father and the Son? That's a song I hope we all can sing. I don't know if we learn the lyrics from someone else or if they simply rise up within. How can I keep from singing? In some ways, this reminds me of section 128 of the Doctrine and Covenants. When Joseph Smith is in hiding, up in an attic somewhere, he can't even stand up straight, and yet he wants to sing. He wants to shout from the rooftop and let people know of the glory of the God he serves. This is section 128, verse 23. Let the mountains shout for joy. And all ye valleys cry aloud, and all ye seas and dry lands tell the wonders of your eternal King. And ye rivers and brooks and rills flow down with gladness. Let the woods and all the trees of the field praise the Lord. And ye solid rocks weep for joy. And let the sun, moon, and the morning stars sing together, and let all the sons of God shout for joy. And let the eternal creations declare his name forever and ever. All the sons and daughters of God shouting for joy. All of creation itself singing praises to her king. And he deserves it. He de deserves it and infinitely more from each of us because of all that he's done for our sake. No wonder, verse 14, this, this scene can close in this way. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. It spread out. It's now come back in. All creation. Praising the creator of it all. I pray that the Holy Ghost helped us feel something in Revelation 4 and 5. I hope it gave us a sense of awe and wonder. If it hasn't, can I invite you to do two things that might help? Because the fact that this came out in song should tell us something. There are times that prose is not enough, we have to do poetry. And times where even poetry is insufficient and we have to add music to infuse those words with feeling, with life. Oh, so here's two songs. I'll, I'll I'll describe them here, or name them, and then I'll put links in the, in the description so that you can find them yourself. The first is called simply Alleluia. It's Hallelujah without the H, okay? It's just another way of spelling it. It was written by a, an Italian composer, I believe, and the Tabernacle Choir performed an arrangement of that song by Mac Wilberg. And it consists of a single word repeated over and over and over again. And that word is Alleluia, which means praise to the Lord. That's what the beasts were singing, what the 24 elders were singing, what the, the myriad angels were singing, it's what all creation was singing. And together, all creation was praising its king. Listen to that song. And as it builds, 
the sense of praise and gratitude and honor and worship will grow within you as well. It's an absolute masterpiece. And then the second one, it's hard for me to decide which I love better. But the second is a, a song of much more recent composition written by a, a composer that recently came to BYU. He's not a member of our church, but he's a man of God named Dan Forrest. And he wrote a song called, And Can It Be? And he's just asking this question in, in awe-filled disbelief. Like, is it even possible that the son could love me enough to die for me? That this lamb could stand as one slain? That this lion could roar my enemies' sin and death into complete subjection? That he would open a door before me at, that no one can close and can it be? It was performed incredibly by the com combined choirs at BYU-Idaho. And it's on YouTube as well. And it's, it's breathtaking. I think it does justice to the feeling that is being described in Revelation chapter 5. So go listen to those whenever you want to join the chorus and feel worship for the Father and the Son. Now, before we close, I want us to remember these two chapters for everything we're going to see next week and the week after, because things are about to get intense in the book of Revelation. And the kinds of last days, Armageddon kinds of experiences that await us, we have to approach them with echoes from premortality, willing us forward with faith. I actually love the way Mike Wilcox described this moment in his book, writing, With the joy of song in our hearts, we are now ready to open the book and view the great battle with the dragon as it unfolds from seal to seal. Yet behind all the horrific scenes of lion-toothed locusts, falling stars, and images built to the honor of devouring beasts, we hear the never-fading echoes of the new song instilling its whispers of ultimate peace and glory. And that's what we'll need moving forward. This is the reassurance of a God in heaven and a condescending Christ who is willing to take our sins upon him. That's the song that will carry us through Armageddon and on to Adam on Diamon. Now, if we can just spend a few minutes reviewing some of the incredible passages that we've studied these last five chapters, just by way of review to cement them into our souls. Here's but a few worth remembering. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. Unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His voice as the sound of many waters. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Do the first works. He that hath an ear, let him hear. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. That which ye have already, hold fast till I come. I will give him the morning star. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain. I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. 
Buy of me gold tried in the fire. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I stand at the door and knock. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. The four and twenty elders fall down before him and cast their crowns before the throne. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book. In the midst of the throne stood a lamb as it had been slain. And they sung a new song. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. My dear friends, will you sing that song with me? Can we be part of that third stanza that encompasses all creation until it rises up naturally from within that we cannot keep from singing that song of redeeming love? If you've ever felt to sing it before, can you feel so now? Can we come to know Christ? Can we do the first works to return to our first love and honor him who loved us enough to lay down his life? I bear my witness of the Father and the Son. I stand in awe of them. And pray that my life may be some small indication of my feelings of gratitude and of worship. The Father and the Son are worthy of all of that and so much more. So may we give it to them with all our hearts, all our mights, all our mind and all our strength.